I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure, because we've got all this fish coming ashore in a big fishery. So, what really happens? You've got to remember that the roads were appalling, rutted tracks. Uh, the most easy methods of uh, transport were by sea and, and um, by river. And there was certainly um, a, a trade happening in this village with uh, coasting vessels coming in, delivering goods into the village. I mean, in more recent times, we know that limestone was delivered for the lime kiln and coal from Wales. Um, what, has, what happened in more recent times was that these boats, which were too big for the quay, came in onto the beach. There's still a ring over by Fort that they moored up to, sort of fixed into the rocks. They dump everything overboard at high tide, push off, and then all the population go down and gather all this stuff up at low tide and bring it ashore for use. And at the same time, um, sailing packets were coming in and picking up uh, barrels of pilchard for export. And I will say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, other aspects of infrastructure. Well, if this was a remote cut-off place, as it was, I mean, less than a hundred years ago, the transport to Garland uh, sorry, beg your pardon, the transport to St. Austell was my grandfather with a wagonette going up there once a week for passengers, or twice a week. And one or two other people did the same thing. It was a, you know, it was a whole day's outing to go to St. Austell, and uh, on the way back, the passengers had to get out and push up Bodrigan Hill. So, what was it like, you know, hundreds of years before that, from the land, not an easy place to negotiate? So there was a case for self-sufficiency. And we know, again, from largely from wills and taxes and other documents, uh, that there were net makers, obviously, in the village. And if I, if I fast forward again to bring history a bit closer to our own time, I can remember dear old Jessica, Jessica Jones breeding up nets in her parlour when I was a kid. Now, at that particular time, I think the nets were going to be used for camouflage netting in the war. But still, the craft was there and certainly lasted into my lifetime, in the days before you know, uh, nets and so on were made on machines. There were coopers building the barrels. And there were cobblers making the great leather sea boots that they wore before rubber started to be imported. And rope was made here, and some of, will, some of you will know. How many people do know, just as a matter of interest, put up your hand. How many people know where the rope walk is? That's considerably less than half. Um, up above the car park, top edge of the car park, there's a hedge. On the other side of that hedge, there's a sort of, I think, a semi-overgrown lane, which runs in a straight line across the top of the car park. Mm. It's still known by local people as the rope walk, mm. and that's where ropes were made in days gone by. Um, just before my lifetime, there was still a cobbler in the village, apparently. Uh, so there is ample evidence that this was a busy, bustling <laughs> fishing community from the 16th century onwards right into the 19th century. The most important bit of infrastructure, though, of course, is the key. The key, um, you know, is uh, a piece of infrastructure which would have made a tremendous difference. The first key here was probably built by Sir Henry Bedrogan, who uh, was a bit of a piratical character and a high liver, but also something uh, of, uh, well, you'd hardly say philanthropist, because he, in building the first key for the fishermen, he demanded a rent of all the head fish, and there were endless disputes about that, and they get a lot of documentary evidence from that as well, which there just isn't time to go into. That first key was probably built in the sort of roughly the middle of the 15th century, and that first key is probably roughly contemporary with our present St. Just Church, which incidentally was restored in the 19th century from the ruin that it had become. There were allegedly six keys in Gorham Haven during the life of the fishery. Um, and I have a uh, print here, which I can pass around in a minute. I have a print here. Is, is that 
even remotely visible, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, a print here of the key which existed before the present one. Mm -hmm. This engraving is from 1825. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. It's by a fellow called William Daniel who went all around the coast mm -hmm. making engravings. When you look at the detail of the key, you can see that in just in its broad form, it's like the present yeah, one. Yeah. But you look in more detail, the steps go the wrong way, the proportions are quite different. Yeah. Um, and in my view, I think, looking at the detail of the end of the key, if I pass this round in a minute, you make up your own minds. I think there might be fragmentary evidence there that that key is already in the process of being seriously damaged <coughs> by the sea. Certainly this key, <coughs> most authorities seem to think it was gone by the 1840s. No key. So there was no key here at Carnhaven until the present one was finished in 1888. Incidentally, in passing, just notice an apparently large ruined building. Have we got my finger on it? Somewhere there. Mm. Where you walk onto the key. Huge ruined building. Now, quite interestingly, my grandmother always used to call that area where you go on the key, she always used to say, oh, that's over Castle. Now, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because on the other side of the harbour, there's Fort. Yeah. We know that there was a battery at Fort at some point, and it would be very consistent with what's happened in, over years in other ports around the southwest peninsula to have two semi-fortifications on each side of the harbour. You can think of places, bigger places like Foy and so on. But it, if that is the case, it underlines the huge importance of the fishery here that it should be thought worthy of defending. And we know that uh, the old enemy, the French, you know, right through the Middle Ages and after came over here beating up the locals and uh, lifting their pots and pinching <laughs> pinching their wives and what have you. So that's just an interesting uh, adjunct to this particular thing. I'll pass it around and take a look. Okay, moving on. The present key was the gift of Squire Williams of Carhays. Um, they were a very wealthy mining family. Apparently they bought a bit of land, the harbour that the Fisherman's Society mm -hmm. owns, they bought it off the Duchy of Cornwall for a fiver. Mm -hmm. Then they built the quay, and with enormous generosity, um, a few years later, they gave it to the fishermen of Goran Haven in perpetuity. And we still have the great benefit of that quay. I just wish they put another 20 foot on it. <laughs> Never mind. Now, <clears throat> I said that I would mention fish processing. What the hell are they going to do with all these pilchards? I mean, tons upon tons upon tons of pilchards. Well, the process, and I'm trying to speed up a bit here, is simply like this. I'll say the words, then I'll explain them. Bulking, salting, packing, pressing, exporting. Bulking was done in bulk houses. It simply meant that on an area of the ground, a layer of pilchards, a layer of salt, a layer of pilchards, a layer of salt, making a great bulk. And sometimes these bulk pilchards would be left to cure for up to a year. I don't think that was always the case. But then um, the villagers would come along, um, women as well as men, uh, they would take these pilchards out of bulk, they would wash them off, and then put them into barrels all set out in a radial pattern, all very, very neatly. And these barrels were then put around the edge of the cellar buildings and pressed. What were they pressed for? They were pressed for pilchard oil, which seeped out through holes in the bottom of these barrels. And that pilchard oil was vital for lighting in the winter and for all sorts of other purposes. I put a diagram up there. A barrel. A row of slots in the wall, and a few blocks set up so that a great press pole can press on top of the barrel, and then a huge weight stuck on the end of the press pole, so that there's constant pressure on the top of the barrel, oil is seeping out of the bottom and collected. 
Uh, some years ago, Henry Jones, the, the our first and former harbour master, and his son Eric dug out our big cellars down here, and they found the gully in which the oil was collected. You would notice that there are slots in the wall all around the big cellar, should you look there, but more interestingly, you can still look at old cottages in the village. Steps Cottage, in what was formerly the cellar, you've got these wall slots. Go up a little bit more, Limpet has still got them, Richard. Yeah, go up to the top of the hill, uh, what is now the sitting room, but what was formerly the cellar of Zion Cottage has got these slots all the way around. In fact, there were pilchered processing buildings, cellars, bulking houses and the like all over the village. When these buildings reached a large scale, they were called, for goodness sake, pilchered palaces. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody realize, if most people realize how incredibly lucky we are to have a rare surviving pilchered palace down on the beach in the form of the big cellars, which is still largely used for maritime purposes. In most places, those pilchered palaces have been turned into gift shops, cafes, and adjuncts of the tourist trade. We've still got one. I mean, a very, very rare survivor, and uh, much of its layout and its uh, internal appearance is as it would have been hundreds of years ago. The top floor, individual cellar, uh, sorry, individual lofts where nets were kept. <coughs> and if you look carefully on the outside of the upstairs doors, you can see the rollers that the nets were paid out across, these huge great seam nets. And then down below, the pilchard processing was done. We can date the big cellars, roughly anyway, because um, it was sold off in shares in the ship in in Medigazi in 1815. And it's remained in lots of different hands ever since. Uh, <clears throat> I might mention that uh, due to the generosity of Hugh Park, the Fisherman's Society acquired a piece uh, back in the 70s. And uh, we've tried to do what we can. You know there's a new roof and all that. To keep the building in good order, we're currently uh, trying to um, cooperate with other owners to take over further repairs and to tart up the front of it a bit. Um, because even in the 1960s, the front of that building looked, you know, to be in pretty good order, even though it was perhaps underused. Um, 